Hi everyone, Tony Tonkin here from Child Protection Party. Glad that you could be with me for our regular feed here on a Sunday night. Now, one of the, the subject that I want to talk about today is a wee bit different, I guess, from what I normally talk about. But there again, who knows what I might talk about, depending on the comments that we get, the number of people that get involved with us this evening. So the primary thing was that I had watched Oranges and Sunshine, which for those of you who have not seen it, is worth viewing. Now, it's available on, I think it was Stan, I might have watched it on. But um, if you've got a streaming software, please have a look for that. Now, the, the idea of Oranges and Sunshine is that a woman by the name of Margaret Humphreys back in the 80s. Uh, well, she's a social worker in the UK and she decided that through some of the clients that she was working with that there was sort of a mystery happening around a number of children that immigrated to Australia back in the 50s and uh, 60s. And as a result of her inquiries, she... Uh, found that there was not just a few people, but there were hundreds of these kids that were sent to Australia. And the issues that were, this created were immense because it was discovered that the government was taking kids from impoverished backgrounds, sending them to Australia, telling the kids in some circumstances that their parents had died or their parents no longer wanted them, and then sending them to the most horrific conditions you can imagine. And there was one particular, um, as an adult, who went back to visit uh, a place that he was sent to in, in WA, which was run by the priests, which was horrific. Um, and as a result of that, you get the impression that... Um, and, and I guess the important thing for me from watching this, and anybody has watched it, please let us know what you thought of it. But the impression I got was that uh, the, they were taking children. So I want you to think about what is different now as opposed to back then. Now, it was the UK. They, it was just after the war. They were taking kids that uh, maybe in some cases had lost their parents, but in many cases hadn't. And Margaret Humphreys, the social worker, found ways to connect some of these families back with their parents. So here we're talking about 40, 50-year-old adults who were attempting to meet up with their parents back in the UK, many of them thinking that their parents had died or hadn't wanted them. And you can imagine what a traumatic experience that was for them. The point was that for me, I started to look at, you know, firstly, this was an exceptional social worker, this woman who fought for these kids. What was unfortunate, I thought about the movie, only one thing, was that the opening scene was a, was a shot of her taking a baby away from a desperate mother who was crying, who was upset. And I guess they were drawing the comparison between the work she did as a child protection worker versus the work she does later in having the same people, if you like, these kids as adults return back to their parents or finding out what happened to them. And she also had some problems, of course, confronting the services that asked that, that demanded that these kids, that the, the services who provided, so the NGOs who provided the service to have these kids removed and taken across, uh, across the oceans to Australia, a country they didn't know. And they, these kids were promised that they would be able to pick oranges from the trees and there is an immense amount of sunshine and they will have the best possible life that they could imagine. Everything would be rosy. The reality was that it was completely different for most of these children. Most of them were sent to homes, residential care facilities, where they were physically, sexually, emotionally and psychologically abused. And I can remember that about 20 years ago, I was working with a man who um, had post-traumatic stress disorder and a whole host of other issues, like drug abuse was primarily one of them. And uh, he came from Fairborn House. Now, Fairborn House was known, I think, in, the, in WA for a horrific environment. And there were a number of these houses similar to that scattered around Australia where they were handed out, the kids were handed out to these NGOs. They were forced to work uh, as kids on the properties. They were poorly educated. 
They were abused in every possible way that you can imagine, and then they were let out into society, often as very damaged human beings. So this product that we that the UK was sending to us were children that were innocent, and then we here in Australia corrupted them, damaged them, and set them out into society, completely damaged. And I can't help but think that we're still doing the same things today, that we're... Um, that that we're fighting people like us and people like CPP and uh, other organisations that work to support kids like Family Inclusion Network and the Riley Foundation are working to protect children so that they don't necessarily have those same experiences as these kids did in Oranges and Sunshine. And that the point was for me that we need to continue this fight that um, so I wrote I wrote a report today for a client, and when I was writing the report, I, I was ruminating over what it was that the department thought was uh, damaging for these children, and I came to the conclusion that the department had defined the parents based on some uh, sketchy uh, reports and had based their whole decision based on a version that they had particularly of the father. I became particularly distressed when I started to realise the impact that those decisions are going to have on these kids because these kids are really good kids, they're intelligent kids, they're smart, whatever. They have their issues, as do most kids, particularly with parents, And but they needed to work through those issues. And it was interesting to note as I was writing that I became more and more aware that the department didn't care about the outcomes that were necessary for these kids. That They just wanted their result, whatever it was that they thought was necessary to happen, protecting their kids in their version, um, when in actual fact, the best protection that these kids could ever have would have been to have remained with their families. But this is, this is an ongoing problem that we have. Uh, trying to fight for and find the right way of working. So. Um, so Margaret Humphreys in Oranges and Sunshine found a pa became passionate about the way that she needed to work to help these families and these these adults, as it turned out. And we in the CPP and for those of us that work in this area need to find the same energy. We need to be able to say when a system is corrupt, when it's wrong, and we need to push back against that system with every ounce of energy that we can. Um, I, was, I was informed last week by a client that uh, a meeting that I attended, so I was asking about this client and, the, and what happened in court for her, and uh, it was raised, the issue was raised that uh, apparently I was aggressive at a meeting that I attended with the department. And, uh, and this is the kind of stuff that I know parents experience also, um, but we as workers, we as people that are advocating for you also experience and that uh, apparently in court um, the Crown uh, or the, the social workers said that I was aggressive in my meetings with them. Um, I've never been aggressive in my meetings. I've been assertive but never aggressive. And, uh, and, and I, I start to think, well, you know, here was the court hearing about me and not and me, you know, the person in question, not having any opportunity to be able to challenge those views. And I keep thinking about parents and how as they're fighting this system, they, they don't have a voice, um, that they're not heard. And I think if someone like me, who does have a little bit of authority given, you know, I'm educated and I'm a social worker and stuff, but you know, that I would think that I have a voice or we have this possibility, we can, um, we can talk to, talk to people here and we can have conversations with you about the things that are important to you and you know we have a group of people that sit around me so in terms of authority we have some but for parents who have no authority or power or whatsoever who are viewed as uh, hopeless helpless and categorized into this um, low socioeconomic perspective where their lives are useless as parents they're hopeless and their kids 
and 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 their kids therefore are going to have these hopeless existences and that they're going to suffer as a result of these terrible parents you know the fact that parents do not have a way of shouting back about all of that to me is particularly concerning um uh, and I just want to say, Clinton, thanks for dropping on board, mate. Uh, the film exemplifies that the power can do so much harm to the vulnerable. I continue to be shocked at the things people do to innocent children. Just think, what would be done if the same people decided to do good instead? Absolutely. Great point. Great point, Clinton. If anybody has watched uh, Sunshine Oranges and would like to comment, please do so. I'd love to hear from you. The point I'm making tonight, I guess, is that we need to we need to all band together. Um, this weekend, I've had uh, Ava and I have had two interviews with two fabulous people, uh, completely different perspectives in terms of the child protection system, uh, but uh, all with a common theme, and that is that they're not heard, they're not understood. And with with the guy I interviewed this afternoon, incidentally, these interviews will be available on our Facebook and our YouTube pages uh, in the next few days after I've post-produce them but um, the, the themes that came out was that in one particular case this particular woman was heard and she was understood and uh, then she was shipped she moved offices to somewhere else because she moved and then a completely different experience from a different set of workers and she expected to get the same results she got the first time and didn't she was completely devalued and as a result a child was removed the second case was uh, a guy who had worked very hard to have his kids return to him because of the behaviour of his ex-partner. Um, but because he was a male, I guess, and because he was categorised in a certain way, popped into a certain basket, uh, he found it difficult in, at the beginning to have his kids return to him. But he did because he worked really hard. Now, the two, the interesting factor that I think we need to note in relation to both of these cases um, was that we have articulate, intelligent, smart, um, connected people who challenged the system as they went through it. And as they challenged it, the, the social workers became a little bit befuddled, I guess, by what it was that they were experiencing because normally they don't get people that challenged it. And, and and this is what happened when I challenge things with the department as well, that they decide that I'm aggressive or they don't know what to do with some of the things that I might ask or the way that I might present myself because that's not what they're accustomed to. They're accustomed to compliance and they're accustomed to agreeability and that's what they expect to experience from most people that they encounter. So in both of these interviews, we asked, you know, what is it important? What is it, what's important that you should tell people about uh, the child protection system? Uh, what advice would you give? And uh, in both cases, they both said, I think, that the best thing you can do is be, have an advocate. And, and the guy that I interviewed today said, you know, the best thing you can do also is to um, be upfront, be direct, do your research, there's a whole host of things he listed that were really important. And I couldn't agree more. But he also said that in the moment of emotion, when your children are removed, you, know, you could understand why people don't think clearly, why their thoughts are scattered, while some of them are angry and uh, attacking. You know, well, we can get all of that. And, uh, and that that's the reason why often you need an advocate because if you're feeling disempowered by the process and everything else that sits around it, having an advocate with you is a, is a, is something that we should all we should that you all should have, and which assists you to navigate through the the trauma that you're experiencing because your children have removed and because you're faced with someone who doesn't listen to you, doesn't understand you, doesn't even want to know what's happening for you. So. Um, and I, I think I asked, I don't know whether I asked both of them, but one of the themes that came out for me was that they were not listened to, uh, particularly the first interview, the, the first time she was, the second time she wasn't. But with the guy, it was interesting. So, you know, at what point did they get to know you? How do they know who you are and how you think and the things that are important to you and therefore the things that are important to the kids? They, they don't make that inquiry. They're not interested in what your background is, apart from the negativity that they experience 
in relation to the allegations that have been levelled at you. But they need to find out who you are. They need to understand who you are. That is extremely vital. Uh, Mahalia uh, says, DCP has just said that we know only, only get to see our nieces once every six months for half an hour. My God, their parents and us are traumatised. They said it's because the carers want it that way and they also, my God, um, towards the career uh, to have bad, uh, as we are traumatised and need a good lawyer. And DCP said it doesn't matter what we try, it's not going to do anything good. Now, can I just ex can I just say, Mahalia, um, that that's extremely distressing to hear that. Um, and I know that you're, you're, it sounds like you're advocating for a member of the family here um, uh, so they have bad behaviours towards the carers so they're blaming us. Of course they do, can't blame them. Uh, can't take responsibility, could never do that. Um, and I think that one, it's, it's, I don't know if you can name who the, uh, who the social worker is here. We have on our webpage, we have a complaint list. So if you wish to complain about any social worker that you're working with or any event that's happened in relation to your children and you're not getting the response you need, go to that page and make a complaint. It's easy to access. Um, also, it will help us to better understand the issues that you're facing and be able to confront the department and the social workers particularly that are acting badly and failing to represent you. Um, so why once every six months? I don't understand how they think that that's helpful for these kids at all. Um, and because the carers want it, the carers, you know, the carers are not, the carers are only the carers. They're not the guardian of your children. That belongs to somebody else, namely the department and the social worker. So I would, uh, I would do what you can to challenge that. If you've got an advocate, if you'd like us to step in, um, myself in particular, and do something in order to confront the department around that, uh, contact CARP, uh, the, uh, child, the Child's Access and whatever it is panel, um, contact them. Uh, Mahala and uh, have a conversation with them about what's been happening because there have been cases where that's actually been overturned. Um, thanks, Clinton, for putting that up there. I appreciate that as well. Um, if you want to have a conversation with us at any time, please uh, do so through here. I will always check the uh, comments that you've made. And uh, I, look, just in closing, folks, we... this battle with the department uh, and with social workers, my colleagues, is, um, is a continual fight. And one day, one day, we're going to bring about effective change so that people will start to act appropriately. You know, the things that we're requiring social workers to do isn't all that hard. There are times, of course, when kids do need to be removed. I keep saying that, and we know that, and no one's going to deny that. But there are lots of other times where the continual removal of children is completely unnecessary, and we need to find a way to have children return back to their parents. You know, a lot of the time, the issues are easily addressed. Um, you know, I was watching, uh, just been watching an episode of... Um, Silent Witness. It's it's three. Um, it's episode. It's it's series eighteen, episode nine or ten, I think. Um, and it's called uh, Protection, and it's just about social work, about social workers and how they work. One particular social worker, um, who certainly at the end of the day decides that suicide is the only way out because she can't protect all kids. Uh, but there was one instance where a child. Um, gets uh, a mother takes a child to hospital the child's got a bruising got a bruise on this child's back uh, and <clears throat> the doctor so someone in the hospital suggests calls uh, child protection services they turn up uh, they're told to keep the child in hospital the parents say nothing happened here they're a middle-class family um, and uh, 
The doctor says, well, look, we'll, we'll keep the child in, look after, we'll do some more tests. And the social worker says, no, the child's definitely got to stay here and we'll look for a family in which the child could be with. The doctor goes away and then discovers that there is a condition that this child has that could be, um, that had nothing to do with being assaulted. It is uh, clotting and uh, it's something that needs to be treated. The social worker, though, and this is so typical, the social worker then says, um, well, I need to protect this child and completely ignores the evidence that this doctor had. And then the doctor meets her after they've gone to court and the court has awarded the child to the state and the doctor says, no, this condition can be met. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to go in and see the judge. And he had the order revoked. So, But that issue around a child being hurt and then someone in an overzealous manner reports that case, allegation comes up, notification is made, and then allegations follow, and then the family are left without their kid. That, Even though that was a dramatised version, that is actually what happens. I've known of many cases where, where an accident happens. I know of someone just recently where a kid fell off a bed and damaged his head at night. And because there weren't previous, previous involvement with DCP, the immediate thing is to remove the child. That sort of stuff has to stop. There are too many kids being removed based on that sort of information alone. So, look, the important thing at this time is to join Child Protection Party. Attend our Wednesday night group sessions. They're fabulous. We'd love to have you aboard. Um, and also, I just want to remind you that tonight at 830 on SBS, there is a show called The Department, which focuses on the child protection uh, services in New South Wales, I think. Um, so worth having a look at. We'll be reviewing that uh, as well. I'll be watching it tonight, and then we'll do a post specifically on that uh, during the week. So I just want to thank for those of you that have joined us. Uh, thanks for doing so. I just want to say also, make sure that at this particular time, as we're opening up, take care of yourself. Look after yourself and be safe.